we are in the final chapter of the book of Jonah. And what an adventure it has been to see this book beyond what we have come to know as a VeggieTales story, right? We have seen that there are concepts and themes throughout the book that are intended for more of an adult audience, filled with this like big guy stuff, seen through a man who represents God's covenant people, so that we as modern day believers might be able to get a glimpse into our own hearts and minds through all of these over-the-top situations that Jonah finds himself in. Throughout the book, the author has been highlighting attributes that we are all susceptible to dealing with, becoming so comfortable in our sense of spirituality that we can actually develop an apathy or an indifference to the struggle of those around us, a blindness to the fact that we ourselves have been recipients of grace, but we cannot see or understand or maybe even agree that those we struggle with the most should receive that too. And the effect that that way of thinking not only has on us, but also on those around us, how we engage with them or how we don't engage with them. And we have also seen the ways that God can use pain and suffering in our lives as a form of immense mercy to wake us up and bring us back to him and what he has for us. These are certainly hard concepts for a child to grasp, let alone an adult, and they are easy to miss in this story, especially if we are more focused on what happens with the fish. The entire point of the book of Jonah is, after seeing ourselves in the person of Jonah, that we would then be redirected back to God, to his character and who he is so that we can be in tune with his purposes. That is the point of all scripture, to shove us back, a word that we looked at last week, that simply means to turn us back to God, so that we can live out the truth of who he is, not only in our own lives, for our own sake, but also so that we can be a part of what he is doing in the world to help other people who have not yet seen the truth of who he is or felt his immense love, to have an opportunity to be swallowed up by his mercy and grace. As we concluded chapter 3 last week, we saw that God moved in some pretty big ways in the hearts of the people of Nineveh. In spite of the fact that the message that they received was short and ambiguous, and delivered by a less than enthusiastic messenger. We had mentioned how great it would be if the book of Jonah ended right there. Jonah fulfilling what God had asked of him and the people of Nineveh restored. Because chapter 3 does end as a success for Nineveh. But chapter 4 picks up with just exactly how Jonah feels about their repentant so let's take a look. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, 
it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I am so angry. I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So verses 1 through, th one through 3. Jonah is very upset, and he is crying out to God, and he's telling him, this is what I tried to forestall. I knew you were gracious. Just take away my life. It's better for me to die. Can we just look at the word forestall? Other versions say quick to flee, but I love the use of this word here because the definition of it is to prevent or obstruct an anticipated event. And that is exactly what Jonah was trying to do, wasn't he? He knew who God was and what he was capable of doing in Nineveh. So he tried to forestall the outcome, as if God can just not help but be God. So he needed to step in, or step out, really. He's admitting that he intentionally got in God's way. However, he is not admitting that because he can see that he was wrong for doing that. He's admitting that because he still completely believes that he was right. I envision Jonah on a football field, this scrawny little scrappy dude, and he sees God coming his way. And he knows God is going to ask him to do something crazy like love his enemies. So he gets down low into this like squat position, ready to sidestep God. But as God approaches, he's coming with these big, long, God-sized strides. And he walks up to Jonah, and with one swift, loving move, he picks him up in a football hold, and he takes him on the journey meant for him. Jonah wants to go to the other end zone. He thinks his plan is better than what God has. I mean, I know it's a really silly example, it is. But when we see a player running down the field toward the end zone and they're pivoting and bobbing and weaving, avoiding the tackle, that is impressive to us. And the more yards they gain as a result of all of those moves impresses us even more, especially if the result is a touchdown. Like we celebrate that. We get up off the couch and cheer over that stuff. But when God asks us to do something and presses upon our heart to take some sort of action, maybe it's talk to a new person, give something away, invest a resource, get out of our comfort zone. Our bobbing and weaving to avoid this only leaves us exhausted. Because is always going to come back and pick us up, take us to the 40-yard line or wherever it is we left off, because what he wants for us is the very best thing for us. And the cheers that result from those kind of touchdowns go into eternity. See, this has been a self-imposed rough journey for Jonah. He is bruised and battered in ways that he did not have to be. We talked about that last week. But in spite of all that he has experienced, the grace that he has received, he's still justifying his actions. He may have consented to obey God because in his heart he knows you can't fight against God and win. He saw that in the storm, and it seemed like he was really understanding that while he was in the belly of the fish. But was he truly changed? See, we can all probably look at examples in our own lives where we have said things during times of feeling pressure or pain or hardship that once that time has passed or the pressure has been released, we forget all about what we said we would do or change. Like the pressure of being inside the belly of the fish. Once Jonah was out of there, once he had done what was asked of him, his old ways returned. And as soon as he had dry land to dig his heels into again, that is exactly what he did. 
his behavior momentarily conformed to what he needed to do. But clearly, his heart hadn't. And the thing is, we too can serve God in this way. We can. We can fulfill actions simply out of an obedience that we know we need to live by. And it's clear that God will work with that. He certainly did with Jonah. But God is after a different kind of obedience, the kind where our heart is immensely connected to the actions that we take. An obedience where we grow closer and closer to him and delight in what he delights in. Because God knows what our lives can look like the things that we can be freed from, the joy that we can experience when we live like that. But at this point, for our friend Jonah, his anger over what has happened to the people of Nineveh consumes him so much that he would rather die than live in the aftermath of their restoration. Seems pretty harsh. He's saying to God, like, hello, this is what I knew would happen. How did you not see it the way I saw it? Just take away my life. I don't want to live. Jonah has come face to face with the fact that God, for sure, loves his enemies. And that result is this big guy, a grown-up, throwing a toddler-sized tantrum. He says, I knew you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who res relents from calamity. At first glance, it simply looks like Jonah is highlighting the ways that he has seen God move before, and that is probably true because if he was paying attention, that's exactly what God has done for him. But he's doing something a little bit sneakier than that. The phrase that Jonah uses here has been described as the John 3.16 of the Old Testament in the sense that it is one of the most well-known descriptions of God. It is a phrase repeated over a dozen times in the Old Testament. But not only that, Jonah has, is specifically quoting from the book of Exodus. And it is a statement that God has made about himself. So Jonah is quoting God to God. And the story that is taking place in Exodus is about the Israelites when they are sitting at the base of Mount Sinai, when God revealed the Ten Commandments to them. The first commandment is to have no other gods before him, and the second is to not make any idols, that God is not an object that be represented based on something that we see here on earth that can then be created out of wood or stone and worshipped. The reason for that was so that they would not focus their attention more on that object and worship it than on God himself. But while the Israelites are waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain, days and days have passed and they are growing anxious. So they decide to take matters back into their own hands and they make a golden calf to represent Yahweh, God. Some really crazy stuff happens, and Moses has to intercede all of this crazy stuff. And ultimately, God once again forgives them, and he renews his covenant with them again. And Moses asks God, why are you doing that? And it is there that God describes himself to Moses using the very attributes that Jonah has just quoted. Israel exists as the people of God because of who God is, because of all of those amazing things. And Jonah takes those words and he throws them back at him like, see, you have always been like this. You yourself said it, as if that's a bad thing. It would be like throwing a great quality that you admire in your spouse or in your friend when you benefit from it back in their face when that same quality maybe it doesn't work in your favor. And being like, you always do that. It's so annoying. Why are you so nice? But the irony is that Jonah would not exist 
as a prophet of Israel if God wasn't like that. He is reacting so strongly in anger that he's basically tossing stuff out at God, kind of going for the jugular with words that pack the biggest punch. You always do this. Redeem people. Forgive them. Give them second chances. Saw this coming. That's why I tried to block what I knew you were going to do. And we as the reader, I mean, we're not overly sympathetic with Jonah at this point, are we? Our sympathy for him has kind of waned as the chapters have gone on. We're sort of like, really? All of these characteristics that God has that you're so mad about, you have been blessed and changed because of them. But the thing is, if you see yourself as a basically worthy person and believe that God owes you good things as a result of who you are, that grace no longer feels like a gift, a blessing. And it can easily start to feel like you are who you are because of you and what you have done. So much so that what you have is no longer even recognized as God's grace to you. So it becomes shocking to you when you see it being given to someone so unlike you. It almost seems unfair. We might not recognize that in ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> but who are we really when we come face-to-face -face with situations that we are 100% convinced we would never find ourselves in? Or when we have to deal with people that we are 100% certain we would never act like? What happens to us in those moments when we are so angry we can barely see straight or the comforts of our life are on the line? That is where Jonah is. His lifestyle, his position in Israel, the stability of his country, in his mind all of these things are on the line. They are at risk as a result of the restoration of the people of Nineveh. What would Israel become? Would he have to fall under their leadership? Jonah is afraid of all of this, and his fear is playing out as anger. I think that is something we can all relate to. We have seen several times now how the story of Jonah is told in this over-the-top, almost comic book style. And Jonah is being shown that way here, too. His feelings are immensely big. But if we were willing to look at the rawest place of ourselves, the truth is, I think we understand Jonah's criticism toward God more than we would like to admit. It's easy to shake our head in disbelief over other people. And it is easy to miss because of our own sense of rightness, that we can be just as damaging. And that is tough stuff. That is hard stuff. It is difficult to see things happening that we don't agree with and react in a way that reflects God's grace and mercy. That is hard. But the thing is, we look like what we love most. We have heard people say that when you have been married for a long time, you begin to look like your spouse. And we know that isn't possible from a scientific perspective, right? But you do start to share the same mannerisms and facial expressions. Your humor is really in line. Even your body language becomes more in tune and reflects back in a similar way. That certainly is true for Chris and I. That picture has never seen the light of day. That's how much I love you guys. <laughs> um, our attempt at the greatest showman, okay? Um, there are people who even start to look like their pets, and there are pictures to prove that, too. <laughs> and we can laugh at that, and it is really good to laugh at that, although 
I may live to regret that photo making a public appearance, but that is okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Things go south, I, at least I can rock a beard. Um, however, when there is something in someone that you love, or a trait, or a characteristic, or even a mannerism that you find beautiful or attractive, you want to emulate that. You almost cannot help but emulate that. And that is the case with God. When who he is, the very characteristics of him, are realized in your life as his greatest forms of mercy and grace to you, they become a life-giving source. And they change you and become such a part of you that they spill out onto other people. And that is exactly what God wants us to do. John 18, 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. 5, 16, let your light shine before others and glorify your Father in heaven. In Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. And if we don't come to that place, we will always struggle. We will struggle over our sense of what is just and true and right. And it will rob us not only of the best that God has for us, but also rob us of our ability to reflect him to those around us. We might reflect something. But will it be the real, honest and true traits of God? So after Jonah has these explosive feelings, God will try to reach him a few more times. In verse 4, the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah's response? Silence. Verse 5. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He doesn't want to hear what God has to say to him. His attention is hard set on something else. He is so convinced that he is right about the people of Nineveh that he knows that they will not be able to hold up their end of the bargain that they will not be able to remain repentant and will go back to their old ways. So he has pitched a shelter to wait out the 40 days, dead set that they will be destroyed. And when that happens, he doesn't want to miss it. Think about that. He is prepared to wait so that he can see them fail. It's another one of those, oh, Jonah, moments. We've had several of those. So God tries to reach him another time. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said it would be better for me to die than to live. Jonah is literally sitting in a shelter of his own sin. And God does something remarkable. He attempts to reach him by providing him comfort through another unlikely vessel, a plant, so that Jonah can have shade. And it is here for the first time ever. We talked about this week one that we will see Jonah happy. It's right now. And he's very happy. But it is super short-lived. Because the next day, a tiny little worm comes and eats to its heart's content. And Jonah's happiness withers away like the plant. And once again, he is angry. So we've had a huge storm, a huge fish, a tiny little worm over the top in every way. But God attempts one last time in this chapter to reach out to Jonah. Verse 9, 
But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And this time he responds. He says, it is. And I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. Like you had nothing to do with this plant. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. Jonah has been so entwined in his own feelings and his own emotions in his anger up to this point, hasn't he? So when for the first time he shows feelings about something other than himself, God tries to reach him through it. Now granted, it is a plant that is giving him something, but it is a crack and an entry point into his heart. So God says, And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And this is more than likely a reference to there being that many children. Should I not be concerned about all of these children and even the animals? God's essentially saying, so let's say your feelings for the plant are justified, Jonah. And you want me to understand your feelings. I'm willing to do that. I am willing to love you through those feelings. But in the same way, can you try to understand mine? How I might feel about an entire city of people who could wither away too. And that's how the book ends. The book ends kind of with a a cliffhanger. (laughs) in the sense that we don't hear from Jonah again. And if I'm honest, it sort of feels like a little bit of a letdown. Because as challenging as Jonah's path has been, you're rooting for him, aren't you? You want him to see what God is very clearly trying to show him so that he can be freed from his anger. As a prophet, delivering a message that brought about such a significant transformation would have been viewed as a great Success, a cause to celebrate. But we do not know how he responds to God, if he does at all. Because at the end of it, God's question to Jonah is really a question to us, to the Jonah in us. What do we care most about? Is it our own sense of security? that we will go to great lengths to protect it, even if it means missing what God is doing around us? Is it being right? Are we so set in our own sense of rightness that we are missing opportunities to shine Jesus to those who are not like us, or think like us, or live like us, or look like us? Do we, through our actions, care more about something so temporary, like a plant? A blessing from God, yes, but also something that that can be gone as quickly as it came. What happens when we value the plant more than the giver of the plant? What happens inside of us when we do that? And what do we reflect out to others as a result. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. God's saying, I'm with you. I know you're going to struggle with this. I know. Keep your eyes on me. Listen to my voice. Immerse yourself in who I am so that you reflect me in your actions and not yourself. I'll fill in the stuff you don't have. Just turn your light on. Begin to shine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for an opportunity to study the book of Jonah. Lord, we thank you that you never gave up on him. 
through all of the situations that he found himself in. And God, you are the exact same way for us. We stumble and we fall, we stumble and we fall, but you are there. And you pursue us with a love like nothing else that we will ever find here on earth. Lord, we thank you so much for not only loving us that way, but loving every single person that way. And may we have eyes to see the people we struggle with, the people we don't understand, maybe even so far as to say the people that we literally just hate. May we have eyes to see them the way that you see them, for your glory and for your kingdom. And it is in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray.